I'm Dr. Anthony Cave, a Stanford and Harvard trained anesthesiologist and integrative medicine specialist. And semaglutide, aka Wagovi, aka Ozempic, are powerful medications and I totally support their use for diabetes and for weight loss. But if you're having surgery, there are a couple of things that you absolutely need to know. Some dangerous, potentially lethal complications from these powerful medications. So we're going to talk about those. And it starts with this giant molecule here. That's very large. That's the actual chemical semaglutide, which is the same as Wagovi and Ozempic. They are branded differently so that they can get by different payment and reimbursement for the indications of their use. But it's the same molecule and the same side effects that you need to know about. The good news here is that, uh, well, that's actually what the little injector looks like. But the good news, unrelated to the anesthesia thing that I'm going to tell you about, is that very, very recently, like literally a couple of days ago, the FDA found that there is so far no basis behind the concerns around increased suicidality, or increased suicidal ideation risk around these medications. So that's very good. The thing that we're going to talk about are the gastrointestinal or GI side effects because this can be problematic. I don't want to gross you out with any pictures here, but a couple of things that have absolutely been recognized as higher risks that can be life-threatening, but fortunately pretty rare, are pancreatitis. This CT scan right here shows a little bit of white stuff in the dead center of that. That is calcification around your pancreas. If there's one thing that I remember from my surgery rotation from medical school, and there's a lot of things I remember, but the big one was that you never mess with the pancreas. We didn't use the word mess. We used a more explicative four-letter word. But you never mess with the pancreas because it controls so many endocrine, hormonal, and exocrine, digestive uh, properties to your body. And when it starts to get inflamed, what we call pancreatitis, and begins to digest itself, it can actually lead to calcific nodules or calcifications. Like you see there, that big white thing is actually calcium, kind of like bone that's deposited within the pancreas. It can occur, albeit very rare, fortunately, under 1% of patients who take any type of semaglutide containing medication, but it's still something important to keep in mind. The next one is bowel, bowel obstruction. This is also very important. It's what you see here. That red arrow is showing what's called a, an air fluid level. When you get so blocked up, like seriously plugged up down there, the fluid in your bowels will actually settle out and form a level like you see there. So it's a telltale sign on CT scans that you see there that you have a serious obstruction, a serious problem that needs to be sometimes surgically fixed. Fortunately, it is very real, but it is very rare. The third one, which is our big issue today, because this comes up in anyone who is having surgery, is gastroparesis. So this x-ray, this isn't a CT scan, this is an x-ray. It shows a big stomach. If you look Right over there where my finger is pointing, that's the top of the stomach. You see a little sliver of black, and you see a bunch of gunk in this extended or distended stomach. This is gastroparesis, which literally comes from gastric, which means stomach, and then paresis or paralyzed. So paralyzed stomach can be incredibly painful and annoying to say the very, very least. Gastroparesis can happen in many conditions, and those with bad renal failure, and those with bad diabetes. And in, in most cases, we actually don't know why patients get gastroparesis, but it can be so devastating because you're always nauseous. And look at that x-ray. Of course, you're going to feel nauseous. If your stomach is that ballooned out, food ain't going down, you can feel horrible, distended, and just... It, it, it's really sad because we don't have good ways of treating it. On the natural side, we can try to use ginger. Ginger root is powerful as a gastric motility agent, meaning you actually can move that stomach around to hopefully get some of that gunk out of your stomach. And on the medication side, we have medications like metoclopramide or Reglan, but these cannot be used, as you know from my past videos, for very long because of the risk of irreversible side effects, irreversible tardive dyskinesias. 
uh, which uh, can be also devastating to social interactions when you literally have these tick-like movements around your face from these medications that alter dopamine metabolism. But the point is that ginger is kind of effective, but ain't going to fix a problem that severe like you see in the x-ray. And raglan is not safe to take for more than a couple of weeks at a time. So this is an increased risk in patients who take semaglutide. Fortunately, it's about 1%, hopefully a little bit less as we get more data. And in most cases, it appears that the gastroparesis reverses or resolves after you discontinue that semaglutide-containing medication. But what happens if you have surgery and you have a stomach that big is the main issue for today. Because I don't want to jump too far ahead in these pictures here. This is showing how even the American Society of Anesthesiologists has recognized how serious of a problem that gastroparesis is in patients who are having surgery. That's a picture that we're going to talk about in a second. I just want to first briefly share that if you are learning something new, if you or a loved one is having surgery, please share this information with them because most anesthesiologists don't even know how important this is because it's so new. So please empower your loved ones. If you support my work here, you know that I don't do ad placement. I want you to be empowered to advocate for your health, for your health excuse me. Uh, do please hit that like button, share what you've learned with others. And if you want to have access to our private Zoom streams to ask me more personalized questions, you can do so by joining our exclusive access. The link is below. We actually have our next Zoom stream coming up right after this YouTube live. And it's an opportunity for you to ask more personalized question in a much more, um, not intimate per se, but a smaller setting. But with that said, Let's go back to the gastroparesis because of how severe this condition can be when you're having surgery, independent of whether it is a heart transplant or a broken bone. Any type of anesthesia required for a particular surgery can make something like you see here incredibly, incredibly painful. That is a camera in someone's stomach who has been on semaglutide that shows a lot of gunk in there. That gunk is a combination of food, biliary contents, meaning bile, that kind of greenish stuff from um, your gallbladder, but also stomach acid. The pH is around 2, 2.3. That's enough, pardon, 2, 2, 3. That's enough to burn your lungs if you vomit that stuff up and you're unconscious under anesthesia and it goes into your lungs. So to be clear, you have that giant stomach filled with stuff like that that you see there that is acidic, pH of two to three, if you vomit that because you're unconscious under anesthesia and the muscles that would protect your lungs, like your vocal cords, might be wide open because when you're unconscious, you don't you lose the reflexive airway protection, meaning the reflexive protection to the entry point of your lungs. This is the most dangerous part of surgery when somebody has what we call an unprotected airway. And if they have food in their stomach, this can be disastrous because it can burn your lungs. Now, here's a picture I actually took of a patient who had stomach contents despite fasting. As you know, we make a huge, if you will, stink, for lack of a better word, around not eating or drinking before surgery. And this is super important because that is stomach acid that I suctioned out of a patient's stomach. We actually put a tube down their esophagus when they're asleep and we suck out as much content as we can. That could have been fatal potentially if they had vomited that up and then uh, had been aspirated, meaning it went into their lungs because they're unconscious. They don't know what's going on. They're just, and then all of a sudden sucks in pH of two to three, burn their lungs, develop a chemical pneumonitis can be fatal even for elective surgery. So the point is that if you have this gastroparesis from semaglutide, you absolutely need to talk to your doctor to know what the guidelines your hospital has around when to stop your semaglutide, whether it's Wagovi or Ozempic. Now, the management depends on whether you're diabetic, because then your endocrinologist might have you do something else to control your blood sugars. Because as you know, when you're not eating before surgery or drinking, your blood sugars might go too high or too low, depending on how you're managing your medications during that fast. It also depends the uh, how long you should hold your Wagovi 
or your Ozempic. Also depends on how often you take it, whether these are day, daily or weekly shots, we might ask you to hold them for a different amount of time. But the point is that it is individualized to your specific reason for taking it, whether for diabetes or obesity, and how often you're taking it. And you don't want to cut corners here because that picture that you see is real life that <laughs> I took in the operating room and somebody had stomach acid that could have, I don't want to be dramatic, but could have killed them. For a routine surgery, for a knee arthroscopy, like could not be more benign of a surgery. Like a, literally a 15 minute surgery that could have gone completely wrong had that been vomited up instead of me sucking it out. Despite them following the fasting guidelines, and just to be clear, when you see this picture here, this is somebody who had been fasting for 10 hours. After 10 hours, your stomach is supposed to be empty. You're not supposed to have anything in your stomach because your stomach naturally should be clearing out everything after eight hours in average individuals. But after 10 hours to have that much stuff means that your stomach is paralyzed. So nothing against these powerful medications to reduce obesity, but we absolutely need to be mindful of the side effects and whenever possible, questioning the risks and benefits, and making sure that we are doing everything that we can to support our own health, hopefully to come off of these medications. With that being said, I can't wait to answer your questions right now live. I see so many comments have built up here. But just one more shout out to you. You have more power over your health than you've ever been told. As you know from watching this channel, please uh, advocate for yourselves. We live in a broken healthcare system where most doctors don't even yet know how severe these side effects from these medications can be during surgery. And you deserve to have the best possible care. So please learn. If you want to subscribe to the channel to keep up with all the learning and ask, ask your questions, I'd love that. But most importantly, you have more power over your health than you've ever been told. Please advocate for yourself and your dear loved ones in our healthcare system. With that, Saying, uh, with that uh, being said, Manjaro asks Stacy, yes, similar GLP 1 agonist, not semaglutide per se, but very similar class, essentially the same concerns here. Kathy, I'm on Ozempic for blood sugar due to hyperinsulinemia, and you've had a Roux Y gastric bypass. So you are, it's so important that you know this and that the audience knows that Ozempic can have a stabilizing effect on our blood glucose levels. It's one of its original uses. And you now know what to do if you ever need to have surgery again. I'm a type two diabetic here, says Jesse. I take Ozempic weekly and I'll have surgery soon. This is good to know. Yes, it is, Jesse. Please tell your doctor. Cool as a cucumber. <laughs> Hello from Wisconsin. Oh, I love that, Caitlin. I don't quite know what the question is, but I love it. Do you think there'll ever be a cure for gastroparesis? Rafi, a lot of people are putting a lot of money into studying that. I don't know the answer, but whether it's a medication or whether it's literally installing a stimulator to stimulate the stomach, I'm sure we're going to find something because it is such a major problem. It doesn't affect a huge number of people, but for those that it affects, in particular diabetics and those with kidney problems, it is absolutely life-altering and maybe life-destroying. It's Lena, wondering if having had pancreatitis in the past increases the risk. Very good question. We do not yet know the answer. At least I am not aware of there being any data, but if it's happened once, you are more likely to have it happen again. So I would not want certainly one of my patients to be taking another or adding another risk factor for pancreatitis if they've had it in the past. Very good question. Hadal hernias, ask Yvonne, Hydal hernias can absolutely increase your risk of aspiration and that really nasty stuff that you saw here in that patient that I suctioned the gastric contents out of because a hydal hernia can also um, mess with the standard gastric emptying times, meaning that NPO guidelines or nilpras, the fasting guidelines, uh, might need to be more conservative in those with hiatal hernia. So it's actually a major issue for any anesthesiologist to be aware of. So you need to tell your anesthesiologist if you have a hiatal hernia, especially if you have a, a history of bad acid reflux with a hiatal hernia. Liragl liraglutide that is daily, not weekly. Uh, Doomster 9. Um, that is a very good question about when to stop it. Typically for weekly, we recommend based off of the American Society of Anesthesiologist guidelines to hold for one week, but you need to speak with your doctor specifically for what their recommendation is. 
Uh, and yes, I agree. This is no joke, 100%. Skater, surfer, snowboarder, good to see you on. After surgery, what are tips to have you kick out the nausea, get back to eating normally, and doing number two normally as fast as possible? So I have whole videos on this. Very good question. In short, you want to have the right mindset because, believe it or not, guided imagery in clinical hypnosis as a patient is falling asleep can impact their degree of nausea after they wake up. That's why I have a particular script that I do with my patients as they're falling asleep. But also making sure that there is adequate movement, there's adequate opioid sparing analgesia used appropriately, meaning we minimize the risk or minimize the use of excess and unnecessary opioids that will be constipating and ensuring that we have the right PT and movement after. Often, uh, thoracic epidurals can be very helpful to help minimize pain minimize constipation and help optimize movement because we don't have as much pain, especially for certain thoracic or abdominal surgeries. Very good question. Um, cheap magnesium supplements will also help you feel nauseous. Well, magnesium oxide can certainly do that. The non-oxide forms of magnesium tend to have less effects like that. There's a reason why we call it milk of magnesia. <laughs> You're absolutely correct. Milk of magnesia because of that very constipating effect of oxide forms of magnesium. Rafi Mando is doing well. He is snoring. I swear this cat has sleep apnea. If you want, I can show him before we sign off. But he's just on his cat tree right now to my left, um, snoring away. <laughs> uh, hey, thank you so much for that, Marianne. Hope very kind of you. I always support your help so I can do this more often because, you know, I don't do ads on this channel. I want to make this as helpful for you. Uh, I will say that you can always visit me in my clinic in San Francisco. The link is below as well. Uh, but moving on, Irene says, do take meds, but no people who do. Have a wonderful day. Have a wonderful day as well. <laughs> and Kathy, we'll get Mando before we sign off. Was on here before and gave too much personal information. Now doctors treat me even more. Oh gosh, Miss V, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, I hope that you have found a happy medium for how much information to share and that you feel empowered to advocate for yourself with your doctor using all the tips we've talked about in past videos on this channel. MECFS and gastroparesis, absolutely there can be a link. There's a lot we don't know about MECFS, which is myalgic encephalomyelitis slash chronic fatigue syndrome. And Sushila, uh, thank you for reminding the audience about just how multi-system the effects can be in MECFS. Um, and the skin pinch test for dehydration is a starting point. Soup is mostly salty water or rehydration. A skin pinch test is a, is a very low cost, semi-effective way of assessing uh, dehydration, especially helpful in children who can't speak to how dehydrated they may or may not feel. Um, and you're very welcome. I hope you're referring to me in that comment. And Marianne Hope, you're right. Mando is a big boy. I think people want to see Mando. Let me grab him. And then you can judge for yourself how big this cat is. Here is Mando. Um, oh, yep. <laughs> hey, little guy. So um, he is uh, he is really big, really um, lick happy. And very loud. He is just constantly like purring. He chirps like a bird all the time. But um, yeah, he's, uh, he's just huge. Look how big this guy is. I don't even know what to say. He's like the size of a little bobcat. Um, all right. Alexis, good to see you. Thank you for clarifying that for everyone. And here's another comment here. Holly, having gastric bypass on Friday, had a paradoxical reaction to Versed. So I did a YouTube short on this just a couple days ago. No effect at all. What can they give me to help calm me down? I have an anxiety disorder. Well, um, wow, this cat is just ready to perch. So very, very, very important point. Tell your anesthesiologist. Unfortunately, there are a lot of um, docs that aren't aware of just how paradoxical the midazolam, which is the chemical name for a percent, can be. I like to give a little bit of propofol um, to patients, just a little bit to help with the anxiety because there tends to not be as much of a paradoxical reaction, at least not with, um, not, not 
the same overlap in patients that have that paradoxical reaction to Versed. And that is Mando taking over my desk right now. Mando, by the way, is short for Mandalorian. And now he's just going after everything on my desk. Great. Rafi, thanks for uh, encouraging this cat to help induce more chaos in my life. <laughs> um, he is a Maine Coon. You are correct, Rudolph. Uh, after DJJ with distended paralyzed stomach, will vomiting and bile overproduction ever stop? Uh, well, stop that. Now the cat is, is terrorizing my desk. <laughs> All right. Uh, the, stop it. Um, typically, there might not be a compensatory reduction in bile production. Gastroparesis is highly varied. It does depend on what the reason for it is, if an ideology can be found, which is not always the case. But um, if you do have gastroparesis, Reglan for short periods of time can be helpful. Um, and you're right. He is a gentle giant. Maybe he likes his salt, but he has a very uh, rough tongue. <laughs> um, and the cat is certainly jealous of technology. You are correct. Hey, thank you for the kind comments here. Karma is not with me right now, but I'm sure she feels jealous that Mando gets all the attention. We'll end with journey. Um, I'm in a hospital right now, diabetic gastroparesis, floating is awful, needs surgery. I am so sorry to hear that. I hope everyone here sends Journey positive energy for her healing during this um, challenging time, not only with the gastroparesis, but also with her need for her upcoming surgery. So please remember that you are not alone. Remember that you have that incredible power over your healing potential when you are empowered to advocate for yourself. And Journey, I am certainly wishing you the best. I hope everyone else here as well. We'll see you next week for our next live stream. If you learned something, do please hit that like button. Send Journey, your positive healing energy. And have a good rest of the weekend. Peace.